Disturbing changes are taking place in the ocean. The chemical makeup of seawater is rapidly increasing in acidity. The last time the oceans went through such a transformation, there was a mass extinction of marine life. At stake now is the survival of countless marine species, vital food sources for billions of people. How do we prepare for an acid ocean? Hey everyone, I'm Tyler. And this is my younger brother, Alex. And together, we're the Water Brothers. We're gonna take you on an adventure around the world to explore the state of our blue planet, a planet defined by water and its ability to sustain life. So join us on our journey as we explore the world, looking at the most important water stories of our time. And together, we will learn how to better protect our most precious resource. For decades, we viewed the ocean as our best defense against climate change. After all, the ocean absorbs over 30% of all carbon dioxide emissions, including from human sources, like the burning of fossil fuels. We all thought the uptake of carbon dioxide into the oceans was a great thing. But what we've learned over the last 15 years, that there's this enormous price to pay by taking up that carbon dioxide in the changing acidification of the ocean. Just as animals on land need calcium to build their bones, many marine organisms require a similar mineral called calcium carbonate to build their shells, organs, and skeletons. But as carbon dioxide builds up in the ocean, it reacts with seawater, making it more difficult for marine life to absorb calcium carbonate. This process also causes the pH level of seawater to lower, increasing its acidity. Although seawater is alkaline and had been relatively stable at an average pH of 8.2 for most of human history, since the Industrial Revolution, the acidity of seawater has increased by around 30%. Scientists know how dangerous ocean acidification can be because it has happened before. By drilling sediment cores deep into the seafloor, scientists have uncovered evidence of a massive climate change event that took place around 55 million years ago, known as the PETM. We had an enormous increase in CO2 in the atmosphere and the oceans over a 10,000 year time frame. So you can see that it was a fairly slow process relative to the changes we are making now. We're making those same kinds of changes over the last two and a half centuries, as opposed to spreading that out over tens of thousands of years. Over the course of the PETM, multiple species completely disappeared from the fossil record, including a mass extinction of shelled marine life living on the sea floor. Recent research shows that modern day acidification is occurring at least 10 times faster than it did during the PETM or any other time in Earth's history. The causes of ocean acidification and its impacts on marine life are based on basic principles of chemistry. They simply cannot be denied. And we know from looking into the past that acidification has happened before and that it has the potential to lead to an extinction of marine life. But what troubling signs can we see in the ocean right now? That's what's brought us here to Vancouver Island to see how the process of ocean acidification is already well underway. In the Pacific Northwest, the waters are already naturally more acidic, and that's because of the ocean circulation. The water here is older. It's had more time for organic carbon to rain down into it and rot and produce CO2 and become more acidic. So, these small changes or the, the beginnings of the changes that we're seeing because of our fossil fuel burning are already causing shellfish here in the Pacific Northwest to have a harder time, in particular the larval stages that form a very susceptible form of calcium carbonate. With wild shellfish populations decimated across North America from centuries of overharvesting, the waters of the Pacific Northwest have become an ideal place to raise shellfish using aquaculture. The states of Oregon and Washington and the province of British Columbia 
are home to industries that produce billions of oysters, mussels, scallops, and clams, generating over $300 million in economic activity. Island Scallops in Qualicum, British Columbia, is one of Canada's largest shellfish producers. In its hatcheries, seawater is piped directly from the ocean into tanks on land, where larvae are grown during their first few weeks of life. Without fully formed shells, these juveniles are at the most vulnerable stage in their life cycle. So I'm going to say 09, 010, the hatchery year, we started to notice that our larvae weren't growing very well. Just as you feed your dog or your pet, you feed it. And if it's not eating, you know that's the first clue that something's going wrong. And that was our first clue. Normally the pH should be about 8.1, 8.2, and it had been that forever. So initially when we started to see pH as low as 7.6, we thought, oh, there's something we're doing. You know, there's our intake or our pumps or you know, it's not the ocean. So we started buffering and we saw a dramatic difference. By buffering, which means adding minerals that remove CO2 from seawater to increase its pH and make it less acidic, hatcheries across the Pacific Northwest have been able to create more stable growing conditions. So we have 40 million oysters swimming around here in front of us. What's the survival rate for, for, for a tank like this? I mean, obviously before the pH was changing, they weren't all surviving. It was zero. Yeah. It was zero? It was zero. Zero. It wouldn't so get all past 40 day, million? All 40 million is dead. On the bottom, day 10, set your watch by it. I'm not kidding. That's how dramatic it was. The financial cost to shellfish farmers across the Pacific Northwest has been significant and island scallops almost went out of business when the problem first struck. Losing, you know, $5 million is not a treat anybody wants to go through. By altering the pH of their seawater, hatcheries have since solved the problem of acidification harming their larvae. But to grow shellfish to market size, all juveniles must eventually be placed into the ocean. Unfortunately, the ocean, of course, we can't modify. We're still not out of the woods yet. Unlike the hatcheries, nothing can be done to protect adult shellfish as they grow for the next three years in the acidifying ocean. On board a floating processing factory, we watched as cages of adult scallops were pulled from the water and sorted for market. So if you take a look in here at this seed, so you'll see some healthy animals that have been growing and they're, they're doing well, but you'll also yeah. find Lots of these little guys here, right, in this kind of smaller size. And if you dig through here and you look at this shell, you'll notice just how fine and brittle it really is. Oh, you just fall apart in your hand. Yeah, I'm not putting any pressure at all, and they just shatter right in half. And that was the, the scallop's inability to produce a thick enough, robust enough shell to carry like on. Yeah, and you can see it all through. I mean, it's becoming a bigger and bigger problem every year. This particular batch that we're sorting right now, I'm only getting about a 52% recovery of what I put in there compared to what I'm pulling out. What would it be normally? Say normally, 90, 90%. 95%, right? You expect some mortality because of handling issues and things like that. To only get 50% back yeah. uh, out of a loading, that's, that's tough, right? Those are tough numbers to work with. Yeah. How often are you seeing these, uh, like, deformities uh, popping it's, up? It's becoming more and more common. I see them every day now. And, you know, to have never seen them before four years ago, to go to seeing them every single day in a sort like this, it, it's disheartening. You know, I've got a crew here working on deck today that's probably six or seven people. You know, four years ago, I was running a crew of 25 guys out here. I was just hopping. You know, you could barely move for crew because there was just so many scallops coming through. Most marine creatures that calcify and build shells are expected to be negatively affected by acidification. But the naturally thin shells of scallops means they are particularly vulnerable. They say don't put all your eggs into one basket. We've only really got one ocean. So, you know, what do you do? If we can't get this problem solved, you know, and, and stop the acidification or, you know, breed a scallop that is more tolerant to an acidic ocean, we'll be out of business. That's all there is to it for us. It was troubling to meet with farmers who are faced with such an uncertain future and to realize that wild shellfish populations have also sustained losses in recent years that are only beginning to be documented. 
If these waters become corrosive enough to harm stronger-shelled adult oysters, the effect on local economies will be much more significant. You know, I think we're the first industry that's actually seen a direct effect from ocean acidification. We're just one of many calcifiers in the ocean. There's a lot of other organisms out there that, unlike oysters, that have people that like to eat them and farmers that like to grow them. And so essentially, you know, they've got a spokesman. A lot of the other organisms that are being affected, they don't have a spokesman because they're down further in the food chain. We like to eat things that they eat, but there's nobody eating them. So pteropods and all these little plankton that are being affected, you know, we don't really know. Farm shellfish are certainly not the only animals being harmed by acidification. Scientists around the world are measuring how changing ocean acidity is affecting a group of organisms called pteropods. Pteropods are these open ocean snails, so they're related to other gastropods that people are familiar with, so that would be like mollusks, bivalves that we eat, mussels, but more closely to ground snails or marine snails, except for they live their entire lives in the open ocean. And as they grow up, they develop these two wings and they flap. That's how they swim, that's how they experience the world. And the original common name for them was sea butterflies. As is often the case in the ocean, small creatures like pteropods play a key role in sustaining marine ecosystems. They are really important because they channel energy from primary to secondary producers. So basically fish and even birds and whales can feed on them. But in terms of ocean acidification, pteropods have really, really thin shells. In fact, so thin that you can see through them, you can see the heart beating. But this makes them extremely vulnerable to ocean acidification, and we are using them as a bioindicator to what extent we have changed carbonate chemistry of the oceans. To measure pteropods' susceptibility to increasing acidity, scientists like Nina and Amy are taking pteropods from the wild and exposing them to varying carbon dioxide levels. After a few weeks of being exposed to CO2 levels expected by the end of the century, pteropods experience dramatic changes. And we have here an active pteropod. We can see a translucent, very nice, smooth shell. And they are responding basically really fast. But in comparison with this, pteropods that got exposed to high CO2 conditions, they will have increased problems with swimming, their shell will look completely different, opaque, dissolved, and so on. We've actually had researchers who have gone to Antarctica and looked at the water and found places where the chemistry has changed so much just based on being a cold ocean and the salinity that it's already dissolving shells. So pteropods in the wild naturally are already showing signs of acidification in certain regions. In colder water, CO2 molecules form stronger bonds with water molecules, causing more of them to be absorbed. So polar seas will experience the effects of acidification much faster than tropical or temperate oceans. With degraded shells, pteropods struggle to swim and will be exposed to higher rates of bacterial infection and predation. And is it possible that the oceans could become too acidic for pteropods? Absolutely, absolutely. By the end of the century, if we continue business as usual scenario, you know, we're going to see in most of the oceans globally very dissolved pteropods, if there are going to be pteropods at all. Even though humans do not directly eat pteropods, many species we do consume, like salmon and mackerel, depend on pteropods as a major food source. And of course, pteropods are just one of countless marine species that build shells. Global fisheries for crustaceans, like lobsters, shrimp, and crabs, are valued at over $40 billion. So even small changes to the shell structure of marine species will negatively impact the global economy and food supply. Unfortunately, scientists are finding that even animals that do not build shells are vulnerable to changes in seawater chemistry. At the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute in Massachusetts, sensory biologist Aaron Mooney has been testing how acidification could affect squid. Squid are considered this really keystone organism in the environment. So basically, almost all animals in the environment either eat or are eaten by squid at some point in their life cycles. For example, 90% of all dolphins and whales forage on squid at some point in their lifetime, and over half make squid their primary food source. 
As it turns out, it's not the squid's body that is affected, but rather a tiny calcium structure in its inner ear. So a statolith is basically a, a nice, dense calcium stone that's really used for balance and orientation, right? So how do this animal know which way it's facing in the environment, which way is up, basically? Is it right side up or upside down? It's this gravity detector, essentially. And we're pretty interested in how that calcium gravity detector is impacted by OA. Um, so in, in order to look at it, we got to open up the squid. So let's go and do it. Let's do it. <laughs> So what species of squid are we working with here? So this is Doritoothus pali, so basically the long fin squid, or the common market squid out here in the East Coast. So this is calamari, what you usually get at a yep. restaurant. So we're just going to kind of slowly slice away at it, almost like you're just kind of creating slices of bread. There, you just cut into the cavity, so that's really a nice cut. When you're ready, you can just kind of take the tweezers, since you guys are going to open it, you kind of reach in, and you're going to feel around for it. Okay, so we'll try and pull that out. Oh man, they're delicate. Yeah. All right. Nice job. So that little thing is what we're, yeah, what so we're looking takes, for here. Yeah, so it takes teamwork to get it out, right? <laughs> yeah. Yep, that little calcium stone is vitally important to the squid. So do you put these things under the microscope and you can see the, the difference? Yeah, nice stella has the calcium crystals arranged in basically nice lines from the center of that stone and those crystals seem to be much more in disarray in these high CO2 exposed animals. So basically that, that ear bone or that little calcium stone is just not as well organized and it seems to be not quite as dense. They, they may just be swimming all over the place. They can't tell where they're going. Right, basically when, that's, when your balance is off, right, you have a hard time sort of orienting which way is left or right or up or down. And so these guys might have a really dramatic difference in, in their ability to swim. Since squid are found in almost every marine ecosystem on Earth, if acidification disrupts their ability to swim, catch food, or avoid predators, the effects will be felt across global food webs. Outside of lab conditions, it's still not clear how marine life will be able to adapt to a more acidic ocean. And while scientists are working hard to figure out how individual species will be impacted, there's still a lot to learn about how entire ecosystems will change. And there's only a small number of places on Earth where we can try to find answers to these questions in a natural setting. And that's what's brought us here, to this very special island in Italy known as Volcano. Well, Italy's an amazing place because it's got lots of massive volcanoes. There's Vesuvius, which is really famous, Etna on Sicily, which is really famous, and this one behind us, Volcano, is Vulcan's Cauldron. It's where volcanoes were named. It's an amazing place because Africa is pushing into Italy, driving up these huge volcanoes. Where you've got that happening, you've got gas coming out the seabed. And some of them, this one included, has got carbon dioxide coming out the seabed. So we think these are really good places for looking into the future of what happens to oceans when carbon dioxide starts to ramp up. Because you can actually see with your own two eyes, this is what it's like when there's high CO2. This is what it is like when it's not. So it's a way of looking into what the whole system might look like in 10 years time or 20 years time. The constant stream of carbon dioxide bubbles increases the acidity of nearby waters. At the bubbling sites, acidic conditions are extreme, far above what is ever expected to occur across the entire ocean. But as the CO2 dissolves, it creates a gradient effect. Just a few meters away, CO2 concentrations reach the same levels that are expected globally in 100 years, then 80 years, 60, 40, and so on before eventually reaching equilibrium and back to present day conditions. Each section of the gradient is like a window into the future. And since 2007, Jason has been studying volcanic CO2 bubbling sites to try and understand which species die and which ones can survive in a more acidic ocean. That's what I'm most interested in is what the survivors are gonna be going through my lifetime and my children's lifetime because that's what we all need to know. As humanity, we need to know what's in store for us. We accompanied Jason on one of his daily dives to survey a CO2 bubbling site and collect marine life specimens from both inside and outside the acidified zones. You can't really do these sorts of experiments in test tubes or in fish tanks because there isn't long enough for those test tubes and fish tanks to, to become like the ecosystem is going to be like in the future. But here, gas has been bubbling out of the seabed for hundreds of years. So if anything's going to adapt or survive to those conditions, this is a good place to go and, come and see that. 
Now, unfortunately, though, we're seeing the fact that some things have adapted and do survive, but many, many organisms are lost and they can't stand these high CO2 conditions. By collecting samples from both inside and outside the affected areas, Jason and his colleagues can measure overall trends and changes in biodiversity. Their findings are not positive. What organisms are you working with and bringing into uh, this area to test like, their vulnerability? The main one we started with was corals, because that's, that's pretty geopolitically important. Will coral reefs survive in the next few decades going forwards? And it looks like when we take most corals into these areas, almost all of them can't. There's a few that can, but unfortunately, if you combine increased temperatures with increased uh, CO2, then that makes the water very corrosive to these animals and they simply dissolve away. Although coral reefs cover less than 1% of the Earth's surface, 25% of all marine species spend all or part of their lives in these habitats. Over half a billion people directly benefit from reefs for food and coastal protection. Their economic value is estimated at $375 billion per year. Corals are probably the biggest of all the different organisms that seem to be impacted by changing acidity. Corals would have to be the, the ones you have to be worried about the most. Absolutely, because they're so important for protecting the shorelines from big storm waves. They're so important for habitat for many species of fish. It was a sobering thought to realize that one of the most beautiful and important ecosystems on Earth could be lost by the end of the century. But some marine species will actually thrive in these more hostile conditions. So jellyfish could do really well in, in a more acidic ocean. Absolutely, they thrive in these conditions with high CO2. You know, they're not dying off. Unlike the corals, their skeletons dissolve away. These don't have skeletons and they're perfectly happy at high CO2. They're a very robust animal. In fact, they're becoming more and more prevalent as their competitors have been removed from the system. As we overfish the seas, there's less and less fish that would normally eat them. They're taking over. So a more acidic ocean would be a much friendlier ocean for jellyfish and things we don't really eat, I guess. That, that's exactly it. We're swapping food, useful organisms for things that are inedible. Not many people would want to eat these jellyfish. Some people do, but they're not as protein rich as the fish and the shellfish. And that's a major concern for food security worldwide. If we're losing those types of organisms and gaining more and more of these jellyfish, that means the whole system screwed up by the increased CO2. So we just reached the top of Volcano, and as you can tell from the sulfuric vents going off behind us, this is still very much an active volcano. It hasn't erupted in over 100 years, but Volcano is actually part of an entire volcanic chain of islands that stretches all the way from Sicily in the south to the city of Naples in the north. And probably the most famous of all these volcanoes is Mount Vesuvius. And when Vesuvius erupted on the city of Pompeii, its citizens had little to no warning of the looming disaster right at their doorsteps. But it's kind of ironic to think that today, this same chain of volcanoes is sending us a clear warning sign with those CO2 volcanic vents. A disaster that could take much longer to take its full effect, but could indeed have a much more destructive impact. Unfortunately, ocean acidification isn't something that's going to happen in the future. It's something that's already happened. The train has already left the station. We've already acidified the oceans. I think we've got a moral duty to look out for the species that are out there, even if we can't eat them. Uh, even if it's not a chicken or a pig, it, it's still a valuable part of the planet's system. I think we're learning to our cost that some of those organisms that perhaps we don't rely on for food, we do rely on perhaps for oxygen or something else that's very vital to the way the entire planet functions. It's hard to predict exactly how the ocean will be impacted by such rapid changes to its chemistry. But no matter the outcome, we don't want future generations wondering why we did so little when we are fully aware of the consequences of our actions. Of course, stopping ocean acidification won't be easy. But what other choice do we have? Everyone is affected by the health of the ocean and we all have a responsibility to reduce our CO2 emissions and our contribution to the problem 
right now. Join us and dive deeper into the episodes at thewaterbrothers.ca.